what does the expression Nordic LARP mean? This question used to be academic or trivial. Five years ago, nobody cared what the exact definition would be. This has changed. Uh, the term has now brand value. It is worth something. And thus, there is something at play in determining what it actually means. If you brand something Nordic LARP, you might get cool indie cred in the US, or you might get players that otherwise wouldn't consider going to your game. For us in the Nordic scene, uh, we used to approach Nordic LARP in the way that, that uh, US Supreme Court justice uh, in the 60s uh, approached pornography. I know it when I see it. <laughs> However, not even we can agree upon what it is nowadays, and this definition doesn't really work for people who are not part of the scene. It just angers people because it, it doesn't give you, give you anything concrete. Of course, there, has, there have been numerous attempts at defining Nordic LARP. Uh, but uh, not only are they in conflict with each other, I feel that they don't really, satis in a satisfactory way, communicate what it is that we do. They don't get at the core. Some of them hang on geography, stuff coming from the Nordic countries. Others concentrate on Knutpunkt, and some relate to the form or the content of these LARPs that we uh, play. Nordic LARP is not a thing. You cannot take it in your hand and see exactly how it functions and what it's comprised of. Nor is it a recipe. You cannot simply follow instructions like uh, one piece of immersion, uh, two helpings of government funding, a splash of touching, uh, <laughs> mixed in a what you see is what you get environment. Uh, it's not a category where by looking at the content you can uh, know what it is, like a vampire LARP, or by looking at the production environment, like uh, indie RPGs. Nor does it remain the same over time. Nordic LARPs today are not the same as Nordic LARPs 10 years ago, and probably five years from now, they will again look a little bit different. If someone comes up with an absolute rule for Nordic LARPs, you can be sure that somebody else designs a LARP just to violate that rule, <laughs> just to show that it can be done. Thus, the problem becomes that there is no objective way to determine what Nordic LARPs are. All definitions are political. They place something at the center, something, something at the periphery, and they leave something out. This is obviously true of what I'm going to be saying today as well. Today I will do my best to give an answer, or maybe a meta answer, but certainly not the answer. And I fully expect to be criticized, ridiculed, and maybe even airlocked the moment this presentation ends. <laughs> For no one owns Nordic LARP, not the game designers, not the LARP rights, uh, not the organizers, not the journalists, not the experts, not the academics, not the researchers, not the event organizers or popularizers, not the web service pro providers or editors-in-chief, not the people who are working to import LARP or export LARP, not even the players. For we all own Nordic LARP. There simply is no central bureau of Nordic LARP. And if there was, I can promise you that splinter groups would surface faster than you can say, fucking fascists try to, li try to limit my imitation, uh, imagination to copyright my reality hacking tools, to steal my status and funding, and to take away my fun and misery. Indeed, when I announced on Facebook that I will be trying to provide an answer to this question, it took exactly 18 minutes for somebody to say that the whole endeavor is wrong, misleading, and frankly idiotic. <laughs> and that is a good thing. We are a creative bunch that is not looking for an end product, but the next cool thing that will, in an, in an inappropriate manner, fonder our souls in just the right way. The term Nordic LARP is not the best possible to describe these LARPs. Others have been floated. Experimental LARP, Art House LARP, Art LARP, Knutlug LARP, Nordic Style LARP, Freeform LARP, Scandinavian Style. We've had a, a number of terms. Then there's been terms like in-drama and interactive improvisation theater. However, the only one ha that has stuck is Nordic LARP. Nordic LARP. I feel I share a bit of the responsibility for that due to the book uh, that we published under that name. We held on to the word LARP, and it is a lowercase word, like laser or radar, and no longer an acronym. 
uh, even uh, we held on to the word LARP, even if it in many places it's sti still, st still seen as a childish activity or used as a derogatory word. Instead of changing the word, we have been fighting to change its perception in the public eye, and we have been quite successful in that in the Nordic countries. In a way, the Nordics have been the center for the LARPer pride movement, and here the stigma uh, related to the word is all but gone. The word Nordic, on the other hand, has always been used in two conflicting ways. It has been used as a term to refer to labs coming from the Nordic countries, but it has also been used to differentiate between the international scene from the uh, national traditions. So Nordic LARP as opposed to and as different from Danish LARP or Finnish LARP. The first usage, Nordic LARP for LARPs from the Nordic countries, is perhaps more common in Sweden and Norway, where the difference between the national scene and the international scene is not as strict. Whereas Nordic, as different from domestic LARPs, has been more common in Finland and Denmark, where the LARPs can be very different on different sides of the fence, or exactly the same with just a different brand attached. Indeed, we, one could easily spend one of these talks just debating the differences between the four countries and how the word Nordic obfuscates the very real uh, differences between the four national and many regional cultures. And that is a discussion we absolutely should take, but in this context, in order not to bore the international audience, I'm not going to go there. But to sum up, Nordic LARP has history been both an umbrella for four national traditions, but also... Uh, for a specific international alternative tradition. Today, however, it's not enough to define Nordic LARP in opposition to Nord Norwegian LARP or Danish LARP. Today we need to also define it in comparison to American LARP, to Buffer LARP, to German LARP, to Festival Freeform, to Jeep form, to theater style. Uh, it's not, uh, and this is because we've attracted international attention. It's not just the Nordic people, or the Nords, as the non-Vikings like to call us, who are into these kinds of experiences. But even that is not enough. We also need to delimit Nordic LARP in comparison to economic simulations, amusement park design, site-specific art, participatory theater, transmedia, experiments, happenings, mixed reality, the list goes on and on. Why is this relevant? Because what we do is relevant in some way for all of these. Because 10 years ago, we read books on invisible theater, went to improv workshops, and played freeform scenarios from Festival. We went anywhere we could, we felt that we could uh, uh, learn stuff about participatory experiences, stole their best ideas, adapted them, and integrated them into our tradition to Nordic LARP. Today we still do that, but the migration of influences now goes in two directions. Role players around the world are paying attention to what we do, if only to disagree with us. We get artists who hire our best designers to help them build their pieces. We get funded to help build civil societies in oppressed areas. We get amusement park research and development people coming over to steal our best tricks for their, their things. We work with teachers and other educators wanting to adapt LARP for the classroom. We get invited to give lectures about transmedia experiences. We get theater directors who want to make their pieces actually participatory. The list goes on and on. So, uh, a lot of people need an answer to the question, what does Nordic LARP mean? Currently, I think that um, the most practical way of viewing Nordic LARP is as a tradition. The works that have influenced people who go to Knutpunkt conference, the works discussed at Knutpunkt, and the work, works inspired by the discourses had at Knutpunkt would probably sit at the core of this tradition. So instead of looking at Nordic LARP as a geography-based or as having a uniform style, I think it makes more sense to approach it as a social phenomenon and as an ongoing discourse. To get a grip on the tradition, one needs to consider the key works, the migration of influences, the social structure, the social situations in which the works emerge, and the people involved. Yes, most Nordic LARPs are played in the Nordic countries, but not all. And not all LARPs played in the Nordic countries are Nordic LARP-style LARPs, whatever that means. And yes, there are some features that are common in the tradition, and production-related commonalities also exist, but they might not be 
different from other traditions. So building a strict definition of Nordic LARP based on these features would be difficult even if no new Nordic LARPs were ever to be created and downright, downright impossible with a living tradition. My strict definition of Nordic LARP is a LARP that is influenced by the Nordic LARP tradition and contributes to the ongoing Nordic LARP discourse. <laughs> I repeat that. A LARP that is influenced by the Nordic, Nordic LARP tradition and contributes to the ongoing Nordic LARP discussion, uh, discourse. This definition may seem circular, but it is not. And that's because it's not a historical definition, one that you can, uh, one that, uh, but one that only works when there is already a, th a tradition and already a discourse. There is a self-congratulatory element to this, one that can be and has been interpreted as elitist. It is built on the fact that there is already a social construct of Nordic LARP with relevant works, theories, discussions and people. There is already a tradition. I'll come back to that. This definition, by the way, is what Bjarke Pedersen appropriated from the art world, what Marcus Montola refined and I then stole and fine-tuned. This is also, as I said, a strict definition. It means that in order to qualify, a work needs to reflect an awareness of a tradition and somehow also to contribute to it. But it also means that in order to qualify as a Nordic LARP, the work needs to be discussed. There needs to be people talking and writing about the work. Strictly speaking, you then cannot advertise a LARP as Nordic LARP. Nor can you say right away after a LARP has concluded whether it was a Nordic one or not. Because the definition work or canonization takes place after the fact. Only after some time has passed, we can see whether or not it actually contributed something. This obviously makes the strict definition a little impractical. <laughs> Thus, we also need a loose definition of Nordic LARP. I've changed one word. A LARP that is influenced by the Nordic LARP tradition or contributes to the ongoing Nordic LARP discourse. This means that any work building on the tradition and wanting to be in dialogue with the tradition qualifies a much larger portion of LARPs suddenly fit this bill. Also, this allows for works that were created disconnected from the tradition to be appropriated in it. This definition may seem disappointing or maybe even like a cop-out. It doesn't arm you with analytical tools that you could use disconnected, disconnected from actual LARP practice to identify a Nordic LARP. But Nordic LARP is not a set of instructions. It is not even a coherent design philosophy though that is a fairly common uh, claim online. It is a movement. Okay, I realize that the problem with this definition is that it doesn't work as a brand statement. It doesn't advertise our excellence. It doesn't communicate our key values to, to people who are interested in Nordic LARP. What would, we, what would we say to them? What is Nordic LARP like? The challenge, is identifying in, I, 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 the challenge is identifying how Nordic LARP is unique, if it indeed is. It's easier to say how Nordic LARP is different from some other traditions, say the UK Fest LARPs or the American Indie scene. Similarly, we can point out the differences between Nordic LARP and participatory the theatre or Nordic LARP and psychological uh, experiments or uh, uh, social psychology uh, experiments. But these differences are also relative and relational. I'll go through some claims about Nordic LARP. Looking at our history, the works we have appropriated, a 360-degree illusion is a strong design ideal. The idea is that what you see is what you get. There is as little as possible symbolic props, and you can work with the environment. Another thing is persistent role play. Uh, you are not your character, role play, and you do not go out of character while the LARP is on. Persistent. There are also uh, physicality and indexical action. Among other, th other things, these things mean that we don't have no touching rules amorous and antagonistic encounters and everything in between is played as is, at least up to a point. However, it is very easy to find exceptions to each of these four ideals, especially when you consider the short convention LARPs that have been strongly influenced by the festival scene. What makes this particularly important is that these small, easy to set up LARPs, though perhaps not at the core of our tradition, are the LARPs that most easily travel 
and the ones that people who are trying out Nordic LARP outside of the Nordics most probably encounter. Another feature often associated with Nordic LARP is immersion, i.e. pretending to believe that you are your character. But immersion is internal to the player. No one can say if you're acting or simulating or immersing or what. And Nordic LARP hardly holds a monopoly on immersion. Furthermore, there are approximately, this is scientific es estimate, a gazillion definitions of immersion. <laughs> so let's not make a key selling point out of something we can't agree upon for even a moment. Co-creation and inter-immersion are key as well. With these words, I attempt to grasp the idea that Nordic LARPs are created together. The participants do not follow a script or just choose from predetermined alternatives. Indeed, they not only play their own characters, but support the play of others. Nordic LARP is not about winning, but about creating something meaningful together. In order for there to be a king, subjects are needed. In order to have prisoners, you need also guards. We play together and we often play to lose. We indulge in tragedies and open the LARP design so that secrets leak out. Yet there are also LARPs that at least some, uh, to, to some degree are about winning. Uh, and there are LARPs that are heavily railroaded. Often there is thematic coherence. Nordic LARPs tend to be about something, be it about love or the war in Afghanistan or loss of humanity. Usually the ideal is to craft the LARP in a way that makes the frame relevant for all participants. As a side note to LARP content, I want to stress the relationship between Nordic LARP and the genre of fantasy. At times Nordic LARP and fantasy are seen as opposing each other. I absolutely disagree with that. I think fantasy games are, are absolutely a part of our history, about our discussion, and, about Nordic, and, and a part of Nordic LARP. Nordic LARP is not anti-fantasy. However, because there is such a strong historical connection between fantasy and role-playing games, it creates in many role-play tradition an at atmosphere that I call fantasy entitlement. In Nordic LARP, fantasy does not enjoy a special place. It is not at the core. It is just one more genre, one more expression of Nordic LARP, just like prison LARPs, or cancer LARPs, or <laughs> queer LARPs. This doesn't mean that Nordic LARP is anti-fantasy, but it does strip away the specialness of fantasy, and that is sometimes perceived as being critical of fantasy. Often Nordic LARPs have minimal game mechanics and few rules, at least in comparison to things like Mind's Eye Theater and the many uh, thick manuals of, of, of fantasy campaigns. Yet blackboxing, meta techniques and such are common. Instead of rule books, Nordic LARPs involve a lot of written game material, but the ideal there often is that less is more. In addition to this, we often have some kind of pre-LARP meetings uh, where diegetic social worlds are co-created. The umbrella term for these is workshops. Nordic clubs sometimes even use complicated systems to lead the players out of the experience uh, in the form of highly planned debriefs. But not all LARPs use workshops or debriefs. Sometimes you just get a PDF in the email, and after the LARP ends, you go to a party. <laughs> Looking at the production side of Nordic LARPs, there are, again, some commonalities. Nordic LARPs tend to be uncommercial. LARPs are not run as businesses, and LARP rights and organizers rarely get paid for their time. This means that there is less of a customer service provider uh, uh, relationship between the two parties than in some cultures. And two things here are relevant. Nordic LARPs tend to be one-shots. Even continuous chronicles usually announce and plan just one LARP at a time. There is no business incentive to keep a campaign going every month. The other thing that is the one of the most perplexing things for international viewers, yes, it is possible to get public funding for organizing an, a LARP in the Nordic countries. Uh, you might get money that, for example, targets youth activities or arts and culture funds, but it is in no way automatic. Most Nordic LARPs are produced with no public funding. The thing that I feel relatively secure in identifying as a feature of Nordic LARP is its taking of LARPing seriously. In the tradition of Nordic LARP, LARP is seen as a valid form of expression one capable of prompting strong emotions and one that can be used to tackle any subject matter. 
This is what people refer to when they toss words around like elitist, artistic, avant-garde, pretentious, ambitious, experimental, committed. The activity is taken seriously even when it's being used for entertainment. So how to boil all this down to an understandable sales pitch, preferably less than 50 words, a brand statement, a bullet point takeaway? This is the brand statement that I came up with. A tradition that views... This is 48 words. <laughs> a tradition... A tradition that views LARP as a valid form of expression worthy of debate, analysis and continuous experimentation which em emerge around the Knutpunkt Convention. It typically values thematic coherence, continuous illusion, action and immersion while keeping the LARP co-creative and its production uncommercial. Workshops and debriefs are common. It doesn't exactly roll off the tongue. <laughs> uh, but I do feel that it is fairly accurate at least now in 2013. But what makes it so special? What sets Nordic LARP apart from other LARP traditions that do similar things? Let's see. To some extent, there is no such thing as Nordic LARP. The whole concept is a fiction. Many things are. A story some of us tell to ourselves to tie things together that actually don't relate to each other at all. Call it social construction, call it reality hacking, call it chaos magic, call it our history. We have chosen uh, certain key LARPs from the 1990s uh, as our history, but these LARPs have very little to do with each other. Even the LARPs that get branded Nordic LARP today may have nothing in common with each other, at least nothing that would separate them from a thousand other LARPs played around the world except that we have socially constructed a tradition out of them. In essence, we in the Nordic community, in the Knutpunkt community, design, organize and play LARPs, we talk about LARPs, and these influence future LARPs. We discuss, analyze and critique and document those discussions. It's not enough that you design and organize a cool game. That is obviously the foundation, but it is not enough. You also need to discuss it with other people in the tradition, and if you want your contribution to last, you also need to document it in a way that makes the LARP and its insights accessible to people who were not there. LARPs are ephemera. The moment they end, they cease to be. Without discussion and documentation, they fade away. How many times have you discovered a fantastic image gallery on the web of some world that you really would have wanted to visit? At least I have many, many times. And how often do you find an accessible description of that LARP event, let alone in a language that you understand? In my experience, rarely. And this is one of the key things that sets Nordic LARP apart. We have not only put up fabulous LARPs and continually worked to hone our craft, but we have tried to communicate what we have learned to others. And in order to make it in a tradition, you need so, so in order to make it in the tradition, you need a piece and you need someone to talk about the piece. And thus, a discourse emerges. And you need to be aware of the history. It is a history you are in dialogue with. Uh, when a new piece is created, it is understood in relation to the tradition, to in to relation to what g went on before. Nordic LARP is a movement and a tradition comparable, at least in its structure, to art movements like situationist or traditions like site-specific art. So, which Nordic games do you need to know in order to participate in the conversation? Today there are pieces, LARP works that you need to be aware of, but there is no master list. Some LARPs are more important than others, at least at this moment in time, for the tradition, but there is no canon, not even the Nordic LARP book. There are canons, plural. Anyone can make their own list, and this is important. Anyone can argue why their canon is the best one. Everyone can, who chooses to participate has a voice, and this discourse is open to new voices. But this is not a case of everyone is entitled to their own opinion. No, not every opinion is as valid, but every considered opinion, one that you can argue for and are willing to defend in public, is valid and enters the discourse. The relevance of different works changes over time, 
as long as the tradition stays alive, the debate will go on. On top of this debate, as part of this debate, we have built the theories, the magazines, the websites, the books, and so on. And again, though we might be able to agree on some key texts, no single person can delimit which texts are relevant. Finally, there are the people. Sometimes the difference between a Nordic LARP and something else is the people who organize it or the people who play it. It's not fair, but the network position of people who have been active in the tradition for a long time does make a difference. Could a person like Johanna Kolinen, who has written about Nordic LARP more than most and who is one of its public adv advocates, could she individually lift a Nordic LARP into the tradition? But it's also a double-edged sword. Could a designer, say Peter Muntekas, who has already created key works in the tradition, could he organize a game that is not a Nordic LARP? Perhaps the community would decide in the debate. Another way to look at the tradition is through history. We have many roots and inspirations that have helped us develop. Role-playing games in general, Dungeons and Dragons, Treasure Trap, Vampire the Masquerade, historical reenactment, folk theater, scout movements, other games, literature, etc., etc. Yet the Swedish LARP Trenebuar from 1994 is usually seen as the Big Bang of Nordic LARP. This is again fictive, after the fact, history construction. The Nordic LARP discourse was built in and around Knutpunkt between 1999 and 2004. That is when a real discussion with a shared terminology and understanding of the various national LARP scenes started to emerge. This is when the most influential manifestos were written. This is when the most fondly remembered LARPs were played. This is when the written, uh, written tradition started. The discussion was not only carried out in Knutpunkts, obviously, but many others played parts. Panklu, the Knut Books, Fea Livia, Larpa, Live Forum, g Punk, Strapatz, uh, Playground, Rolipela, there's a number of these. Others have joined the discussion from Germany, Russia, Italy, France, US, and elsewhere. We have been influenced by other role-playing cultures from the Forge to Jeep form. We have discovered gameplay and role-play analysis and research. We have watched reality television and tried out improv, stolen stuff from theater and performance, read up on philosophy and game design, dabbled in social psychology and art. Sometimes older LARPs that have not been part of the discussion are appropriated. Sometimes LARPs that seemed very big at the time fade away, away from the tradition. This too is similar to how the arts discourses operate. We have also recognized that our tradition can be a little bit hard to penetrate for an outsider. Not everyone can fly to the LARPs we organize or to Knutpunkt, or there aren't that many people who have the conviction to wade through all the Knut books and the academic articles and everything that we have produced. So we have tried to open the discussion with things like Nordic LARP talks, the Nordic LARP book, articles, books, podcasts, websites targeting people who are not already in the know. The Nordic LARP discourse was created and I think is still centered around Knutpunkt. This is the annual event that brought people uh, from numerous countries and this is the nexus that, that still sort of uh, ties the discussion together. However, it doesn't mean that Knutpunkt is only about Nordic LARP discussion. Not everyone goes there for the main discourse. Also, it's hardly the only relevant hub for the discourse today. Other places such as Fastaval, Ropecon, Prolog, Odras, Mittelpunkt, LARP Symposium, Wurtgon, uh, to name a few, have joined the discussion. Some of these are relevant because they attract the same people or discuss the same topic. Some because they provide counterpoints and, al and alternatives. Some because they disseminate our LARPs and theories or publish stuff that furthers the debate. Yet there are also art festivals, academic conferences, educational symposiums, humanitarian workshops, and others that linger at the edges of this discourse. And it is this discourse that makes it possible for us to debate things like, was the Monitor Celestra in fact a 1990s style LARP, sort of a sequel to Hamlet? Or we can ponder, based on this tradition, just how Justin the Loving broke the queer mold of Nordic LARPs. We can ask what new, if anything, Kapo brought to the table. We can analyze how Perinto 1963 was incorporating insights from the German tradition. 
we can talk about the pervasive years. We can talk about the bleed turn. We can talk about the manifesto boom. The tradition is the foundation and the reference point. It provides meaning, it provides context. So, the world is filled with awesome LARPs. What is a Nordic LARP? A Nordic LARP is a LARP that is influenced by the Nordic LARP tradition and contributes to the ongoing Nordic LARP discourse. We have designed, organized and played some of the coolest LARPs on the planet. We have picked them apart, we've analyzed them and we've tried to do better. We have built a tradition of learning from our mistakes and from our successes and we have used that knowledge to develop an understanding of LARP and to build more LARPs. And we have conducted this discourse in public in a way that makes it possible for a person who was not there to get a glimpse of what it is that we're going on about. What sets Nordic LARP apart from other LARP traditions is that we have not only taken our activity seriously, but we have actively tried to make the discourse about it accessible. The open discourse it is what drives us forward and attracts new people to the table. Thank you.